We think our patch symbolizes the teamwork, not only here at the Johnson Space Center, but across the NASA contractor team and uh, bridging the oceans all the way over to Russia. And I think the successful accomplishment of Shannon's long duration mission and our successful docking and uh, joint operations aboard the Mir is a uh, testimony to that fact. The Russian space station Mir hosted American spacecraft Pepsi this week. Two Russian cosmonauts on space station Mir took a spacewalk with a large nylon and aluminum replica of a new Pepsi can. The tethered can was put in orbit 200 miles above the Earth while they filmed a new commercial to be released in 1997. The Russians had no real Pepsi drink on board, but PepsiCo is paying the Russians a seven-figure sum for their cosmonauts to pose with the can. U.S. astronaut Shannon Lucid told reporters she is enjoying her marathon stay. If she remains in orbit for more than four months, she could well set the record for the most time an American has been in space. CNN's John Holloman has details now on Lucid at the halfway point. But there's a, a lot of Shannon Lucid there is at the halfway point in her four months living with two Russian cosmonauts aboard the Mir space station. She says you just can't beat it. Uh, it's been very rewarding, I think here on a long space flight to be able to see the changes that are taking place on the Earth, especially the northern hemisphere as the seasons change. Uh, we've been able to see the lakes and the rivers, the ice is uh, breaking up, and uh, we've been able to see it, you know, turn green as uh, spring has advanced and beginning of summer. It's just uh, uh, very rewarding. Lucid is conducting experiments on herself as well as the cosmonauts with a new lab shipped up from Russia several weeks ago. She says she hasn't noticed any psychological changes in herself or the Russians, but she is changing physically. Uh, only thing that I've really noticed physically that's changed is the bottom of my feet, because I'm not using my feet. The callus is better on the bottom of my feet, because I always went, bare, I mean, uh, went barefooted all the time I was back home. Uh, they've practically disappeared, and I have practically new skin on the bottom of my feet. The biggest problem about working in weightlessness, losing tools. You put things somewhere and then you forget where they are or things have been put somewhere and you don't know where they are and it just takes a lot of time just to get everything together that you need to do. What Shannon Lucid says there's nothing special about her. She's just your average person having fun. She tried to get the Russian commander to fire his engines and send the space station to Mars the other day, but the commander says he promised his wife he'd be home in August. So will Shannon Lucid. John Holloman, CNN Washington. Lucid is about halfway through her four-month stay aboard the Russian space station Mir. She is conducting experiments on the effects of long stays in space. During a Space to Earth news conference, Lucid er urged the world space agencies to start drawing up plans for a pl manned mission to Mars. She also spoke fondly of her Russian crewmates. All along, I've always said that uh, you know, it doesn't make any difference what kind of complicated science experiments or complicated satellites or what have you that you might uh, do on your flight. What makes a flight memorable, what makes it something that uh, you'll always remember the people that you work with. And uh, if you have, you know, really good people that you're working with, then it's a great flight. It doesn't make any difference what the actual work is that you're doing. And um, I just have absolutely wonderful people in Uri and Uri to work with, and um, it's just been going really fine. In der Raumstation Mir müssen 40 Tage länger im All bleiben als geplant. Nach Angaben der russischen Raumfahrtbehörde fehlt das Geld für den Bau einer Trägerrakete. Onofrienko und Usatschew können daher erst Ende August zur Erde zurückkehren. Ihre Kollegin, die US-Astronautin Lucid, solle aber wie geplant von einer Raumfähre der NASA abgeholt werden. Mir going to have to wait an extra 40 days to get home, due partly to lack of funding. Cosmonauts have been there since late February. They're scheduled to stay until late July. Russia now says it's going to be late August, though, before it can afford to bring them back home. U.S. astronaut Shannon Lucid joined them in March, but she's returning on schedule via a U.S. shuttle in early August. It muss wahrscheinlich länger als geplant im All bleiben. Lucid ist seit einem Vierteljahr zu Besuch auf der russischen Raumstation Mir und sollte eigentlich Ende des Monats von der amerikanischen Raumfähre Atlantis abgeholt werden. Wegen eines Defektes der Antriebsraketen verschiebt sich der Start der Atlantis um mindestens drei Wochen. As Hurricane Bertha swirls towards them. Bertha's generating winds of up to 185 km per hour, making it a dangerous Category 3 storm. 
Doch aus Angst vor dem Wirbelsturm Bertha, der zurzeit auf den US-Bundesstaat Florida zurast. Die Wetterexperten rechnen damit, dass der Hurricane in einer Stunde die Küste erreicht. Auf den karibischen Inseln hat Bertha schwere Schäden angerichtet. Es kam zu Überschwemmungen und Erdrutschen. Der Sturm blies ganze Häuser weg. Insgesamt starben vier Menschen. An der amerikanischen Ostküste haben sich die Menschen in den vergangenen Tagen mit Hamsterkäufen und Holzbarrikaden an ihren Häusern auf den Wirbelsturm vorbereitet. Jetzt fliehen sie ins Landesinnere. Auf den Highways bilden sich kilometerlange Staus. An der Küste Georgia sollen in ein paar Tagen die olympischen Segelwettbewerbe beginnen. Die Mannschaften haben ihre Boote aus dem Meer gezogen und in Sicherheit gebracht. Die NASA transportierte in Cape Canaveral aus Angst vor dem Sturm die Raumfähre Atlantis von der Abschussrampe am Meer in eine Halle. Leo hat neue spektakuläre Aufnahmen geliefert. Die gestochen scharfen Bilder zeigen die Oberfläche des Jupitermondes Ganymed. Sie besteht aus gefrorenem Wasser, verunreinigt durch Gesteinsteile. Helle und dunkle Flecken unter der Oberfläche weisen darauf hin, dass riesige Eisschollen sich untereinander geschoben haben. Einen Kurs auf die Südostküste der USA fortgesetzt. Hier Satellitenbilder des Wirbelsturms, der einen Durchmesser von 750 Kilometern hat. In der Nacht war Bertha rund 120 Kilometer nördlich der Bahamas-Insel Great Abaco und fegte weiter in Richtung Nordwesten. Das Hurricane-Zentrum in Miami befürchtet eine Sturmflut. Die Behörden forderten rund eine Million Menschen von Florida bis North Carolina auf, ihre Häuser und Wohnungen vorsichtshalber zu räumen. Zu Tausenden verließen Bewohner die Florida Keys. In zahlreichen Orten wurden Häuser und Geschäfte vor dem herannahenden Sturm gesichert. Erste klare Bilder vom Jupitermond Ganymed. Sie wurden von der Raumsonde Galileo aus rund 800 Kilometern Entfernung aufgenommen. Zu erkennen ist die Vorderseite des Mondes, die durch Einschläge von Kometen und Asteroiden geformt wurde. Die Oberfläche Ganymeds besteht aus eiszerfrüchten Rillen, Kratern und Gräben. Die deutsch-amerikanische Raumsonde Galileo war 1989 von der Raumfähre Atlantis ausgesetzt worden und nach 640 Millionen Kilometern im vergangenen Jahr in die Atmosphäre des Jupiter eingetreten. Ganymed, einer von vier Jupitermonden, soll von Galileo in den nächsten zwei Jahren noch mehrfach aufgenommen werden. Nachrichten aus dem All. Die amerikanisch-deutsche Raumsonde Galileo hat spektakuläre Nahaufnahmen vom Jupitermond Ganymed geliefert. Die Sonde war am 27. Juni bis auf 843 Kilometer an Ganymed herangekommen. Erst jetzt sind die Bilder auf der Erde angekommen und von der amerikanischen Raumfahrtbehörde NASA veröffentlicht worden. Ganymed ist der größte Mond in unserem Sonnensystem. Diese Bilder zeigen die Vorderseite des Mondes. Zu erkennen sind riesige Krater, die durch den Einschlag von Kometen und Asteroiden entstanden. Außerdem sind Gebirgszüge zu sehen, die durch ähnliche Kräfte entstanden sind wie auf der Erde. Die Bilder haben meine kühnsten Vorstellungen übertroffen, sagt Jim Head, einer der NASA-Wissenschaftler. Galileo hat auch aufgedeckt, dass der Jupitermond ein eigenes Magnetfeld besitzt. Eine solche Magnethülle ist bisher noch nie in der Atmosphäre eines Mondes festgestellt worden. In den USA sind Hunderttausende auf der Flucht vor dem Hurricane Bertha. An der Küste North Carolinas wird der Wirbelsturm voraussichtlich aufs Festland treffen. Bereits in der Karibik hatte er mindestens vier Todesopfer gefordert. Sturmwarnungen in den letzten 24 Stunden von Florida bis Virginia. Polizei fordert Touristen und Anwohner auf, die Gegend zu verlassen. Hurricane Bertha nähert sich Amerikas Ostküste. Langsam 20 km pro Stunde. Die Windgeschwindigkeit im Zentrum des Sturms ist freilich zehnmal so hoch. Hunderttausende verlassen Hotels und Ferienhäuser. Anwohner nehmen mit, was in den Wagen passt. Vor der Abfahrt wird noch schnell getankt, um weit genug zu kommen. Hurricane Bertha rückt auf einer Breite von über 600 Kilometern an. Ein frühzeitiger Abzug, um später Chaos zu vermeiden. Trifft der Sturm erst die Küste, ist es für Flucht zu spät. Bertha kommt von den Bahamas. Morgen solle Hurricane North Carolina angreifen. In Florida ist Bertha nach einer plötzlichen Drehung mittlerweile vorbeigezogen. In South Carolina are under a state of emergency. Forecasters are watching as Bertha's 160 km an hour winds edge towards the Carolinas. 
Die Land ist vorsorglich wieder in den Hangar gebracht, während die US-Marine ihre Schiffe auf die offene See schickt, damit sie in den Häfen nicht gegen die Kais geschmettert werden. In Florida gab es bereits wieder Entwarnung. Unter den Tausenden, die aufatmen konnten, befanden sich viele verschreckte deutsche Touristen. Rund 500.000 Menschen waren im südlichsten US-Bundesstaat aufgefordert worden, sich vorsorglich in Sicherheit zu bringen. Auch wenn Börter im letzten Moment noch auf den Atlantik abdrehen sollte. Bei Windgeschwindigkeiten bis zu 170 Stundenkilometern würden riesige Sturmfluten die Küsten bedrohen. Die Szene hat mittlerweile wieder etwas an Stärke zugenommen. Windgeschwindigkeiten bis zu 170 Kilometern in der Stunde. Die Böen sind natürlich noch wesentlich stärker. Und er wandert etwa mit 17 Kilometern in der Stunde. Off, some wind was shattered as the hurricane named Bertha was lashing the fragile barrier islands of the area. Wind gusts up to 169 kilometers an hour. The storm intensified a bit as it turned toward land. Landfall is happening now. Forecasters expect it'll quickly lose strength, though, as it moves inland. As premier newsman has died. NBC anchor, reporter and commentator John Chancellor died Friday at his home in New Jersey. He's perhaps best known for being let off the floor of a political convention and reporting on his removal live. As he disappeared from view, he signed off saying, this is John Chancellor, somewhere in custody. John Chancellor dead at the age of 68. Bei Wilmington in South Carolina das amerikanische Festland erreicht. Der Sturm wurde von heftigen Regenfällen und Windböen von bis zu 170 Kilometern pro Stunde begleitet. Er erreichte allerdings nicht das befürchtete Ausmaß. In der gesamten Region richtete Bertha beträchtliche Sachschäden an. Verletzt wurde ersten Berichten zufolge niemand. In Cape Hatteras in North Carolina fiel eine ganze Tankstelle in sich zusammen. Überall wurden Ziegel von den Dächern abgehoben, Bäume sowie Strom- und Telefonmasten umgeknickt. Zahlreiche Ortschaften sind bis auf weiteres von der Stromversorgung abgeschnitten. Das genaue Ausmaß der Sachschäden ist bislang noch nicht abzusehen. Rund 275.000 Anwohner und Touristen waren gestern, teils widerwillig, aus der Küstenregion evakuiert worden. Doch die heftigen Regenfälle und Sturmböen rechtfertigten die Vorsichtsmaßnahmen der Behörden. Inzwischen hat Bertha auf dem Weg nach Norden weiter an Stärke verloren und fegt nur noch mit Windgeschwindigkeiten von knapp 100 Stundenkilometern über die Bundesstaaten Virginia und Rhode Island. Insgesamt hatte der Hurricane mindestens acht Todesopfer in der Karibik und den USA gefordert. Bertha hat sich vor einer Woche über dem Atlantik gebildet als Hurricane. Der zog dann Richtung Westen, streifte die Dominikanische Republik und dann die Bahamas. Kurz vor Florida bog er allerdings dann nach Norden ein auf die amerikanische Küste zu und letzte Nacht ging es dann in Süd- und Nordcarolina rund. Aber so schlimm, wie befürchtet, war er dennoch nicht. Er schwächt sich jetzt ab, wird aber weiter an der Küste entlang nach Nordosten ziehen. Unser Wetter beeinflusst während der nächsten Woche wohl eher positiv. Die Wärme bleibt und am Mittwoch wird es sogar noch wärmer. Hello and welcome, I'm Miles O'Brien. NASA's Galileo spacecraft is giving scientists something they've never had before, close-ups of Jupiter's moon Ganymede. And the pictures are upsetting a lot of theories about the big moon's icy landscape. Mark Bernheimer reports. They are images of Jupiter's giant moon Ganymede, sent back from the Galileo spacecraft. These images are fantastic. We're seeing things that are 20 times better than we've ever been able to see on Ganymede before. In fact, we could recognize something as small or smaller than a football field if it happened to exist on the surface of Ganymede. The pictures may not mean much to the untrained eye, but to scientists they reveal fascinating detail. Craters formed by the relentless pounding of comets and asteroids, and huge faults in the moon's icy surface suggesting volcanic and tectonic activity not unlike that on Earth. Scientists here at Jet Propulsion Laboratory were thrilled by the clarity of Galileo's pictures, but they were totally caught off guard by some other non-photographic data sent back by Galileo, evidence showing that Ganymede is unlike any moon they have ever studied. When Galileo passed within 500 miles of Ganymede, it began to pick up readings suggesting a magnetosphere or magnetic field. Magnetospheres are not uncommon surrounding planets, but have never before been detected around a moon. What we think we've found here is, in effect, a, a baby magnetosphere inside Jupiter's own magnetosphere. And the most logical way to produce that is that Ganymede also has a magnetic field attached to it, which is surprising. 
and the surprises will keep coming. Scientists expect more data from Galileo in the months ahead, many times more detailed than what amazed them this week. Mark Bernheimer, CNN, Pasadena, California. Those images were taken last month when Galileo flew close to Ganymede's surface. That was the first of four flybys of Jupiter and its major moons planned for the next two years. Scientists looking for planets outside our solar system have a new way to do it. It's based on the fact that when light coming from a distant star passes close to a planet, the light gets a little brighter. Don Knapp explains. Scientists, unable to actually see dark planets beyond our solar system, have come up with a few tricks of physics to find them. Researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory build on an earlier idea. Gravitational fields surrounding planets, moons, and stars magnify light passing through them. And an object with mass passes between us and that distant star. When they line up, the gravitational magnifying lens effect causes the background star to, to appear brighter. That may explain what happened with this star 160,000 light years away. It's a very faint object, and in particular, it's much fainter than these neighbors. Then over the passage of time, we're talking about weeks here, it got steadily brighter until in this image here, you can see that this star is now brighter than its two neighbors. Researchers working with Charles Alcock charted the star's increasing light, then predicted an even greater burst of light would reveal a planet. They asked the question, what happened if this dark object had a very much less massive object in orbit around it, much in the same way that the Earth is in orbit around the Sun. And they've, they've calculated to show that it would cause a brief modification of the brightness of the star that might last only a few hours. Meanwhile, two other scientists plow ahead with a light measuring technique that turned up six new planets in the past year. The planet pulls on the star and makes the star wobble around due to the gravitational pull. So we monitor something called the Doppler effect of the star's light. Jeff Marcy and partner Paul Butler's discovery prompted NASA to consider a massive project to map new planets and eventually photograph them with space telescopes. So what's going on is a sudden burst of interest in a problem that has been around for hundreds of years, but we now finally have the ability to look for planets. Now there's scientific competition to find new worlds. The first step towards finding life is finding planets like the planet Earth in orbit around stars like the, the Sun, our own Sun. So if we find those systems, that will intensify the speculation that there's life out there. The Livermore researchers say a worldwide network of telescopes might find three to six Earth-sized planets a year. And this week, Marcy and Butler begin a new search to determine what percentage of the stars in the universe have planets. They say they have a feeling most do. Don Knapp, CNN, Berkeley, California. The Lawrence Livermore scientists are trying to involve telescopes all over the world in their project. Since the brightening effect they're watching for lasts for just a few hours, they need observers in all time zones so they don't miss anything. In the past, this factory used to produce some of the intercontinental ballistic missiles that formed part of the Soviet Union's Cold War arsenal. But today, military orders are being turned away as the Khrunichov Space Center aggressively commercializes. That aggression seems to be paying off. The factory has won more than a billion dollars in orders so far. In stark contrast to the Cold War years, Western companies are coming to Moscow. They look on the Russians as a reliable, cost-effective alternative for launching satellites to Europe's problem-plagued Ariane. The Russians, presiding over a rare economic success story in Moscow, say there will be many more opportunities for international cooperation in the space industry. I believe the potential for cooperation is far from exhausted. It's not limited to just proton launches of foreign satellites. I think that the field of cooperation in space with Russia is vast. It's all a far cry from the conventional picture of Russia's space industry. Boran, the Soviet's attempt to copy the space shuttle, is now a mere museum piece in Moscow's Gorky Park. But behind a factory's closed doors, Russia is using the scientific and engineering expertise it developed during the Cold War to plan a successful and prosperous future in space. Simon Marks, ITN Moscow. Ist die Biochemikerin schon an Bord der 
russischen Raumstation Mir. Und heute bekam sie eine Hiobsbotschaft. 45 Tage länger als geplant muss sie da oben ausharren. Die Raumfähre Atlantis sollte sie eigentlich Ende Juli zur Erde zurückholen. Wegen defekter Triebwerke aber kann die Fähre erst Mitte September starten. Shannon Lucid nahm es gelassen, ihr Kommentar. Ich hoffe, dieser Rekord hält nicht allzu lange. Dabei habe sie sich doch schon so auf irdische Kartoffelchips gefreut. Aber das könne ja noch warten. Amerikanische Astronautin Shannon Lucid hat einen neuen Rekord aufgestellt. Seit 116 Tagen lebt die 53-Jährige an Bord der russischen Raumstation Mir und ist damit länger als jeder amerikanische Astronaut vor ihr im All. Dort wird sie noch bis Mitte September bleiben, denn die geplante Rückkehr zur Erde Anfang August wurde wegen technischer Probleme an der Raumfähre Atlantis verschoben. Den Weltrekord hält ein Russe mit über 400 Tagen im All. Russian cargo spaceship has docked with Mir, delivering fuel, food and water to two cosmonauts and U.S. astronaut Shannon Lucid. All have been delayed from returning to Earth. There is no spaceship available to bring the Russian cosmonauts home and a problem with a U.S. space shuttle has extended Lucid's stay aboard the Mir. Nicht ganz bis zum Mars geht die Reise der nächsten Ariane-Rakete. Der Start von der europäischen Raumfahrtbasis in französisch Guyana ist für heute Nacht vorgesehen. Es wird der 90. Ariane-Start seit 1979 sein und der dritte seit der Explosion der Ariane 5 im Juni. Die Rakete soll zwei Fernmeldesatelliten aus Frankreich und Italien ins All bringen. Der Start musste auf heute verschoben werden. Es gab Probleme mit der Treibstoffleitung. Das Ersatzteil lieferte die deutsche DASA in Bremen. Die europäische Trägerrakete Ariane ist erfolgreich gestartet. Die Rakete der vierten Ariane-Generation hob in der Nacht vom Raumfahrtbahnhof Kourou in französisch Guayana ab. An Bord hatte sie zwei Telekommunikationssatelliten, die wenige Minuten nach dem Start im All ausgesetzt wurden. Bis zum Jahresende sollen noch vier Ariane-Missionen folgen. Vier Rakete von der Raumfahrtbasis Kourou in französisch Guayana abgehoben. Bei dieser 90. Mission der Ariane wurden zwei Fernmeldesatelliten ins All gebracht. Auch der achte Start dieses Raketentyps in diesem Jahr ist ohne Komplikationen verlaufen. Der Veröffentlichung von neuen Fotos der Raumsonde Galileo hat die US-Weltraumbehörde NASA die Aufmerksamkeit der Wissenschaftler auf den Jupitermond Europa gelenkt. Die Fotos deuten darauf hin, dass es möglicherweise Wasser auf Europa gegeben haben könnte. Wissenschaftler vermuten sogar, dass der Jupitermond unter seiner eisigen Oberfläche einen Ozean und damit ein Ökosystem verbergen könnte. Im kalifornischen Pasadena erklärte der Geologe Ronald Greeley, dass Europa viele Voraussetzungen für eine Art primitives Leben erfülle. Die auf den Fotos zu erkennende geologische Bewegung könne von flüssigem Wasser unter der Eisschicht stammen. Die Existenz von Wasser auf dem Jupitermond ist allerdings nicht schlüssig bewiesen. Im Dezember soll die amerikanisch-deutsche Sonde Galileo noch genauere Bilder zur Erkundung des Jupiters und seiner vier größten Monde Europa, Ganymed, Callisto und Io liefern. Auch auf dem Jupitermond Europa könnte es primitive Lebensformen geben. Die US-Raumsonde Galileo lieferte spektakuläre Fotos, die unter der aufgebrochenen Eisschicht des Europamondes ein Netz langer Gräben zeigen. Vermutlich Wasser, die wichtigste Voraussetzung für Leben. Allerdings, die Bilder wurden aus einer Entfernung von 155.000 Kilometern geschossen. Im Dezember ist Galileo nur 600 Kilometer weit weg. Dann erwarten die Forscher schärfere Aufnahmen. Galileo zur Erde gefunkt hat. Die Bilder ähneln dem eisbedeckten arktischen Meer auf der Erde. In ersten Reaktionen erklärten NASA-Forscher, die Suche nach außerirdischem Leben sei zum Schwerpunkt ihrer Arbeit geworden. Weltall aufgenommen von der Jupitersonde Galileo. Geschossen wurden sie etwa 700 Kilometer von der Erde entfernt auf dem Jupitermond Europa. Die amerikanisch-deutsche Raumsonde Galileo funkte diese Bilder von der Eisoberfläche des Jupitermondes. Geysir-ähnliche Eruptionen und die an vielen Stellen aufgebrochene Eiskruste könnten, so NASA-Wissenschaftler, auf einen Ozean unter dem Eis hindeuten. Möglicherweise eine ökologische Nische für Lebensformen. Genauere Erkenntnisse erwarten die Forscher im Dezember, wenn sich Galileo dem Jupitermond bis auf 600 Kilometer genähert haben wird. One of two satellites already released into orbit is expected to monitor the Earth's environment for the next three years. It is to collect data on changes in the climate and ozone layer and it will track how tropical rainforests are faring. Japan, the US and France have invested more than a billion dollars in the project.
Die japanische Trägerrakete ist vom Weltraumzentrum Tanegashima erfolgreich ins All gestartet. An Bord ein Forschungssatellit bestückt mit acht Sensoren aus den USA, Frankreich und Japan. Herstellungskosten umgerechnet etwa 265 Millionen Mark. Von seiner Umlaufbahn 800 Kilometer über der Erde soll er meteorologische Daten sowie Angaben über Treibhausgase und Ozonschicht liefern. Außerdem setzte die Rakete einen kleinen Satelliten für Funkamateure aus. due to mark a new chapter for space travel in France. Along with two Russian cosmonauts, the rocket will be carrying the first French woman astronaut. Claudia André Deche will join Russians Valery Korzun and Alexander Kaleri in the mission to dock with the orbiting Russian space station Mir. André Deche will carry out biological and medical tests on board Mir for 16 days before returning to Earth. We hope to bring you live coverage of the launch in 15 minutes. But first, here's Larry King. The following is CNN's coverage of a live event. Hello, I'm Relitsa Vasilova. We now take you live to the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan for the scheduled liftoff of the Soyuz U rocket. This moment is a source of great pride for France. The rocket carries their first woman in space. Her name is Claudie André Deche. Her picture was all over the front pages of Paris papers Saturday. She told Le Figaro that she can't wait to see if it really feels like you're flying like a bird. We see now a tape of the training that uh, Claudie André Duché underwent with her two cosmonaut crew. Uh, she's flying together with two Russian cosmonauts. Their names are Valery Korzum and Alexander Kaleri. They trained they didn't have much t time to train together because she was initially uh, scheduled to fly with uh, another crew, but unfortunately the captain of that crew fell ill, and uh, these two cosmonauts were a last-minute replacement for, uh, for the, the original crew. We're now watching live pictures. Uh, we expect liftoff to be in about a minute. Uh, again, we're at Baikonur, uh, the Cosmodrome at Baikonur, the launching pad in Kazakhstan. That is where the Soviet Union's uh, uh, space program used to be centered. All the liftoffs were that after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Baikonur uh, is still uh, Russia's space station's liftoff uh, you know, pad and uh, center uh, under an arrangement with uh, Kazakhstan, which became an independent uh, state after the breakup of the Soviet Union. These pictures, by the way, are coming to you courtesy of the French space agency CNES. Let's stand by to see if liftoff will take place now. The weather looks perfect for launch. We're expecting a launch any time now last moments before launch. The gantry is dropping, falling away. We are moments from launch. We're not hearing the countdown, though. seconds away from the launch of the Soyuz U rocket for a rendezvous with the Mir orbiting space station. The engines are on. And launch. like a nice launch 
It will be close quarters in the Soyuz uh, rocket for the three, the crew of three. It was not meant to be for three people, but uh, the Russian space agency has been strapped for cash after the fall of fall out, uh, the falling apart of the Soviet Union. So they have not had an opportunity to build um, a bigger rocket. Nevertheless, they're on their way to the Mir orbiting sp space station. Uh, the French astronaut will spend 16 days in space. Her two Russian fellow crew members will do a much longer stint in space, 225 days. They are replacing Russian cosmonauts Yuri Unufrienko and Yuri Usachev, who have been on the Mir since February. And we witnessed the picture-perfect launch of the Soyuz U rocket for a rendezvous with the Mir orbiting station. And we would like to remind you that uh, the French space agency CNES is providing us with these live pictures from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And that concludes our live launch of the Soyuz U rocket for rendezvous with the Mir space station. Thank you for joining us. I'm Relitza Vasilova. This has been a CNN live event. Madame, Monsieur, bonjour. Le départ de la première française dans l'espace sur la base de Baïkonour, c'était il y a quelques minutes un départ réussi. Selon l'agence TASS, Boris Yeltsin aurait demandé à son ministre de l'Intérieur de poursuivre son travail alors qu'Alexandre Liebet demandait sa démission pour faciliter la paix en Tchétchénie. Et puis à la fin de ce journal, encore de très belles images de Venise avec notamment la découverte des lagunes qui entourent la ville. C'est donc il y a quelques instants et je vous propose ces images qui montrent un départ réussi qui a eu lieu à Baïkonour avec les astronautes à bord en direction de la station spatiale Mir. Et vous le voyez donc, c'est sur cette steppe kazakh et dans un ciel presque sans nuages, deux heures avant le coucher du soleil que la fusée s'était lancée avec notamment à son bord la française Claudie André de Zé et les Russes Valéry Korzoum et Alexandre Kaleri. C'est donc le début d'une grande aventure également pour cette jeune française. Française et pour les cosmonautes, il aura fallu évidemment mettre tout en œuvre pour que rien ne soit laissé au hasard. Retour sur un compte à rebours riche en suspense. Le rideau se lève, c'est un peu comme à Versailles au temps du roi. La cérémonie de l'habillage et la cour. Un instant magique qui précède le départ. Voici l'équipage de la fusée Soyouz, Valérie Korchoun, le commandant de bord, Alexandre Caléry, ingénieur de bord, et Claudie André Dehay, la cosmonaute française. Elle semble radieuse. On essaye ensuite le scaphandre. Il doit être parfaitement étanche. En cas d'éjection de la cabine Soyuz, il agira alors comme un canot de sauvetage. La pesée pour finir. Le Soyuz ne peut emporter que le strict minimum. La famille, Madame André, la mère de Claudie est présente. Le frère, la sœur de Claudie, tous sont là pour l'encourager à deux heures du départ. À bord, évidemment, les cosmonautes ne manqueront pas d'activité au cours de cette mission baptisée Cassiopée. Ils doivent réaliser une série d'expériences médicales, technologiques, en apesanteur, et cela pendant 16 jours. Merci. Hein. Voilà, ça surprend. Oh, c'était presque réussi, à une seconde près. Ah, allez, celui-là, il est bon. Claudie, la gagneuse, a répété des dizaines de fois avec la rigueur scientifique du médecin Calais et différentes expériences de la mission Cassiopée qu'elle a en charge de réussir. Ici, par exemple, l'expérience Conilab, qui va consister à étudier comment le cerveau soumis à l'absence de pesanteur contrôle et perçoit les mouvements. Autre expérience sur les sciences de la vie, Physiolab, où c'est la physiologie cardiovasculaire qui est mesurée pour une meilleure connaissance du fonctionnement du corps humain. Elle est destinée spécifiquement à essayer de mieux comprendre pourquoi il existe des hypotensions, c'est-à-dire des troubles de la tension artérielle au retour d'un vol, comme il peut en exister aussi euh, au sol, chez, chez des patients qui font chuter leur tension artérielle. Pour mieux le comprendre, on enregistre simultanément la pression artérielle et la fréquence cardiaque pour analyser deux facteurs qui interviennent sur ces mécanismes de régulation et d'adaptation de la pression artérielle. Six salamandres déjà fécondées sur Terre feront également partie du voyage avec l'étude de la croissance de leurs embryons. Une mission de 14 jours dans laquelle Claudie ne sera pas le seul cobaye. Un hour ago, Russia also launched a spacecraft into orbit.
A Soyuz spaceship with two cosmonauts and a French astronaut on board blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Claudie André Deschet is making history by being the first French woman in space. The spacecraft will rendezvous with the orbiting Mir space station. Stay with us. World News will continue. für die russische Raumstation Mir ist heute ins All gestartet. Die Trägerrakete mit einer französisch-russischen Mannschaft hob vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur in Kasachstan ab. Erstmals ist eine Französin, die Ärztin André Deye, mit an Bord. Zusammen mit ihren beiden russischen Kosmonauten Korsun und Kaleri soll sie am Montag an die Mir andocken. Der russischen Raumstation Mir ist auf dem Weg ins All. Neben zwei russischen Kosmonauten ist zum ersten Mal eine Französin an Bord. Die 39-jährige Claudie André de Haye ist Ärztin und wird während ihres 16-tägigen Aufenthaltes biologische und medizinische Experimente durchführen. Wie ihre Kollegen wurde auch sie auf die Erde gesetzt. Aus Kostengründen flog das Trio mit der Trägerrakete Soyuz U. Weil die eine geringe Nutzlast hat, musste Gewicht gespart werden, auch beim Personal. Claudie André Dossé est une jeune femme de 39 ans. Elle est médecin et elle était donc à bord de ce vaisseau Soyuz qui vient d'être lancé de la base de Baïkonour. Elle est partie en compagnie de deux Russes et elle va rejoindre la station orbitale Mir où elle restera deux semaines afin d'y mener différentes expériences scientifiques en médecine, en biologie et en physique. Hello and welcome. I'm Ann Kellen. Miles O'Brien is on assignment. It's hard to remember the last time so much attention was focused on space, ever since last week's announcement that simple life may have once existed on Mars. This week, there are more tantalizing hints that Earth may not be the only place able to support life. Jim Hill reports. Pictures from the Galileo space probe show Jupiter's moon Europa and its crisscross pattern of surface cracks. Interstate highways, the scientists have dubbed them, believing they are cracks in Europa's icy crust and may indicate the presence of water beneath the surface. That mobile zone could be either soft ice or possibly liquid water. And the point is, these are places that would be uh, environmentally favorable for life. While there is no evidence of life on Europa, water is considered the single biggest component necessary to support life. Scientists have long thought that the moon Europa, like the planet Mars, could be one of the few places in the solar system able to support primitive forms of life. Only last week, NASA revealed patterns in a Martian rock which could be fossils of primitive bacteria. Meanwhile, Galileo also sent back pictures of another moon, known as Io. Scientists can compare the new photos with those taken by Voyager 17 years ago. They show changes in the moon's surface, indicating a turbulent, dynamic environment. My conclusion about is that Io is the most exciting place in the, uh, <laughs> in the solar system. It's been described as a wonderland of chemistry and physics, and we should go back there often. Photos also show new images of Jupiter's giant red spot, which has been observed by astronomers for 300 years. Computer imaging shows it to be a huge hurricane with counterclockwise winds of 250 miles an hour. As for life there... For any proto-organisms on Jupiter, they get carried up to where they get uh, destroyed by ultraviolet light and carried down where they get cooked. <coughs> so it doesn't seem likely. Coming on the heels of the Mars rock, NASA is clearly hoping this means more public interest and public money in the future is likely. Jim Hill, CNN, Pasadena, California. Those pictures of Europa were taken from almost 100,000 miles away. In December, the Galileo spacecraft will fly much closer to Europa, just 6,000 miles above its surface. And scientists are waiting eagerly to see what those images reveal. Meanwhile, students from several Colorado universities were exploring a little closer to home this week. A sounding rocket launched by NASA carried a student experiment 60 miles above Earth on Monday. The payload gathered data on high-altitude ozone, then dropped into the ocean as planned, where it was recovered by the Coast Guard. It's part of a NASA program designed to give undergraduates experience in developing experiments for suborbital flight. 
Scientists at Los Alamos National Lab had some disappointing news for UFO believers this week. A piece of metal supposed to be from a UFO crash is made of very ordinary earthly materials. The metal scrap was tested at the request of a Roswell, New Mexico UFO museum. Museum officials say the fragment was found by military personnel investigating a mysterious crash near Roswell back in 1947. UFO buffs have long insisted that it was an alien spacecraft that crashed in 1947. For just as long, the Air Force has maintained that it was just a spy balloon. Even though the recent test did not find any unearthly substances in the sample, museum officials are not giving up. They say maybe current testing techniques just aren't good enough to spot extraterrestrial materials. Satzung für die russische Raumstation Mir hat ihr Ziel im All erreicht. Gegen 17 Uhr dockte das Raumschiff Soyuz TM24 mit den Kosmonauten Korsun und Kaleri sowie der ersten französischen Raumfahrerin André Dey an der Mir an. Inzwischen sind die drei in die Station umgestiegen, wo zwei andere Kosmonauten und die Amerikanerin Lucid auf ihre Ablösung warteten. Hier die ersten Bilder des Andock-Manövers. An Bord der Soyuz-Rakete waren am Samstag drei Wissenschaftler vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur gestartet, darunter eine französische Astronautin. Sie befasst sich während ihres 16-tägigen Aufenthalts im All mit biologischen und medizinischen Experimenten. Ihre beiden russischen Kollegen bleiben 225 Tage auf der Station Mir. Sie lösen die Kosmonauten ab, die dort seit Februar in der Schwerelosigkeit leben. Es ist eine Menge von Eukaryotes an Bord der russischen Spacestation Mir at the moment. On Monday, a Soyuz spaceship docked with the orbiting station, delivering a crew of three, two Russians and France's first female astronaut. They joined three veteran space travelers already on Mir, including American Shannon Lucid. Lucid has been on Mir since March, giving her the U.S. record for longest time in space. She is scheduled to be picked up by the space shuttle Atlantis in September. And back on Earth, NASA successfully launched into orbit a new spacecraft called FAST. Three, two, one, drop. FAST indeed. The FAST Auroral Snapshot Explorer rocketed into space aboard a Pegasus XL launch vehicle. The new satellite houses a battery of instruments designed to study the electromagnetic fields that envelop the Earth and cause, among other things, the northern and southern lights. Fast should start transmitting data back to Earth in about a month. Hier auf dem Atlantik hat sich inzwischen eine richtige Hurricane-Familie gebildet. Das einmal Eduard, Fran und Gustav hier. Ich kann Ihnen zumindest Eduard und Fran etwas größer zeigen. Sie sind beide hier schon vor der Karibik, während Eduard sich doch langsam abschwächt hat sich Fran hier so richtig entwickelt. Sie sehen diese Mühlenräder quasi oder Windmühlenrad. Da wird sich noch ein bisschen weiter verstärken. Aber auch Eduard, der jetzt langsam gegen diese Kaltluft hier von, Groß, äh, von äh, der USA strömt, kann sich Eduard wahrscheinlich noch mal ein bisschen verstärken, wird dann aber nach Norden abgetrieben. Wir unterhalten Sie auf jeden Fall in den nächsten Tagen noch weiter über diese Hurrikane. Das war es Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend. Die Menschen in den Badeorten an der amerikanischen Atlantikküste bereiten sich auf den Hurricane Eduard vor. Meteorologen können nur schwer einschätzen, ob und mit welcher Wucht der Hurricane das Land treffen wird. Sicherheitshalber wurde von North Carolina bis Delaware Katastrophenwarnung erlassen. Die Bewohner müssen sich auf heftige Regenfälle und hohen Wellengang gefasst machen. Schon im Laufe des Samstags machte sich Eduard, der Windgeschwindigkeiten von rund 190 Stundenkilometern entwickelte, mit deutlich stärkerer Brandung bemerkbar. Eduard hat tropische Stürme im Schlepptau, deren mögliche Auswirkungen noch nicht abzusehen sind. Most US citizens are enjoying their last big holiday of summer. But for some, it's a race to get away from the storm. That's because Hurricane Edward appears to be setting its sights on the northeastern coastline, with the state of Massachusetts as direct target. Hundreds of beachgoers and residents are pouring out of the coastal cities in the state. Currently, the seas are rough all along the eastern seaboard. The storm is packing winds of up to 170 kilometers per hour, but forecasters say Edward is weakening. Day landed Monday along with two Russian cosmonauts. She spent 16 days aboard the space station Mir, carrying out biological and scientific experiments. How was her trip? Beautiful, wonderful, Andre Day said. Everything went well. C'était très bien. Elle l'a simplement dit à son retour sur Terre avec le sourire. André Dezé, cette Française, s'est dite enchantée de son séjour dans l'espace avec ses deux compagnons russes. Sa capsule s'est donc posée 
très exactement à l'endroit prévu. Lunettes noires, les bras chargés de fleurs et le sourire aux lèvres. Visiblement, notre spationaute française était à son retour sur Terre ce matin en bien meilleure forme que ses deux compagnons de voyage. Pour les deux Russes qui viennent de passer plus de huit mois sans éprouver la moindre sensation de poids, la réadaptation à la pesanteur terrestre semble en effet plutôt pénible. Radieuse, Claudie André Déès semble cependant quelque peu fatiguée par 14 jours de travail intensif à bord de la station Mir. Alors avant de regagner la cité des étoiles à Moscou, elle s'est isolée dans cette énorme tente gonflable, histoire de subir les premiers examens médicaux. Et coquetterie féminine oblige, elle en profite même pour se remaquiller avant de nous livrer ses premières impressions. Des expériences vraiment sensationnelles, c'est fascinant, c'est même un peu irréel, tellement c'est beau. Alors c'est vrai qu'on a, on a envie de, de vivre plusieurs fois des bonheurs comme ça. Alors je reste disponible s'il y a des possibilités. J'ai aussi plein d'autres choses intéressantes à faire dans la vie. Mais euh, j'ai vraiment vécu là quelque chose de très très fort, de très dense, très intense. À 3h du matin la nuit dernière, les trois cosmonautes ont donc quitté la station Mir pour s'installer dans le Soyouz. Trois heures d'attente pour vérifier l'étanchéité, puis c'est la séparation. Encore trois heures de voyage avant l'ouverture des parachutes à environ 10 km du sol. Et à 9h41 précis ce matin, le vaisseau s'est donc posé comme prévu bien à la verticale, en plein cœur du Kazakhstan. Protégé par son bouclier thermique, la capsule a en tout cas parfaitement résisté aux échauffements lors de son entrée dans l'atmosphère. Mais pour Claudie, c'est loin d'être fini. La première française de l'espace est désormais une star. Et pour elle, les séances de photos et les signatures d'autographes ont déjà commencé. Voilà, c'est donc bien parti pour elle. Après 16 jours, on s'en doute d'une expérience inoubliable où elle aura réalisé toute une série d'expériences médicales ou biologiques en apesanteur. Et ça s'est très bien passé, rappel. Baïkonour, 17 août 1996, après 11 ans d'attente, enfin le voyage pour la première cosmonaute française. En compagnie de deux Russes, Claudie André de Haye découvre avec étonnement les sensations du décollage. Plus tard, à bord de la station Mir, elle savoure les joies de la pesanteur. On est dans une forme exceptionnelle, désorientée bien sûr en arrivant dans cette grande station, quand il y a un volume énorme, il faut appréhender les distances, les volumes, la façon de se déplacer. Chacun doit rapidement prendre ses repères. Ici, dans le module principal, la chambre à coucher de Yuri Onufrienko. Pour suite de la visite, c'est donc ici que se déroulera la mission scientifique d'une durée de 14 jours. Une mission rythmée par des repas pour le moins insolites. Au menu aujourd'hui, tomates flottantes et jus de fruits réhydratés, séquence dégustation. Et puis il y a aussi les tâches ménagères, mais surtout le travail. Environ 14 heures par jour pour mener à bien des études sur le développement des embryons de salamandres en apesanteur, ou encore les mécanismes de perception des forces et du mouvement. Bref, un programme bien chargé. Malgré la fatigue, l'épuisement, après 16 jours dans l'espace, notre première cosmonaute française garde le sourire. Elle avait attendu ce voyage depuis si longtemps. Dans le reste Erde, mit dabei die französische Astronautin André de Chaise. Sie war 16 Tage in der Weltraumstation Mir. Ihre russischen Kollegen hatten dort ein halbes Jahr lang Experimente in der Schwerelosigkeit durchgeführt. In einer Klinik müssen sie sich jetzt wieder an festen Boden unter den Füßen gewöhnen. Ja, der Hurricane Edward der hat inzwischen eine weite Reise hinter sich. Vor ein paar Tagen lag er noch hier in der Karibik. Inzwischen hat er diesen Weg eingeschlagen auf die Ostküste der Vereinigten Staaten zu. Er hat einen Nachfolger, Fran, und Fran zieht sozusagen auf seiner Spur Richtung Nordwesten. Fran wird sich auch im Moment noch verstärken. Etwa 130, 40 Kilometer in der Stunde Windgeschwindigkeit. Er soll in zwei Tagen 190 Kilometer in der Stunde drauf haben und sich so etwa auch Richtung Nord-Nordwest bewegen. Inzwischen ist die Situation hier ein bisschen äh, gebannt. Es ist nicht mehr ganz so schlimm an der Küste, denn er hat wieder den Kick raus auf den Atlantik bekommen der Eduard und wird wohl jetzt sich abschwächen und Richtung Osten ziehen, während eben, wie gesagt, Fran sich im Moment noch verstärkt. Ja, das war's vom Wetter. Jetzt schauen Sie noch mal in Kulturzeit rein. Tut auch mal wieder gut. Ihnen einen schönen Abend und Tschüss. Tour sur Terre après 14 jours passés dans la station orbitale Mir. L'atterrissage du Soyuz TM33 à bord duquel elle se trouvait a eu lieu ce matin à 10h moins 10 dans un champ de blé non loin de la base de Baïkonour. 
On la voit à l'image. Atterrissage sans problème avec seulement 30 secondes de retard sur l'horaire prévu. Claudie André Déhé était en pleine forme alors que les deux cosmonautes qui étaient avec elle pour le retour étaient très éprouvés. On l'a vu, il faut dire que les deux Russes sont passés six mois dans la station Mir. Une station qui, au passage, fête ses 10 ans cette année à un âge plutôt avancé pour un vaisseau de ce type. Les explications de Nicolas Anchot, notre spécialiste. Plus de 100 tonnes lancées à 28 000 km à l'heure autour de la Terre. Mir reste toujours l'unique station spatiale créée par l'homme. Lancée progressivement par l'élément dès 1986, elle atteint aujourd'hui 30 mètres de long. Elle a permis de battre tous les records de séjour dans l'espace, parfois plus d'une année. En 10 ans, ces cinq laboratoires situés près du module d'habitation ont permis d'accumuler un nombre incroyable d'informations sur la vie en apesanteur, au point de transformer parfois Mir en une petite ménagerie. A l'origine, Mir a été prévu pour ne durer que 8 ans, puis pour être remplacé en 1995 par Mir 2. Or, il n'en est rien, Mir restera en service jusqu'à la fin du siècle. Bien sûr, beaucoup des systèmes ont été améliorés pour conserver un niveau de sécurité suffisant. Les Américains s'en sont même mêlés pour que leur navette puisse s'amarrer à l'habitation spatiale russe. Peu de crainte donc du point de vue de la sécurité, à moins qu'un météorite ou qu'un débris spatial ne vienne heurter le module d'habitation. Mais ce n'est en tout cas pas ça qui traumatise apparemment les locataires de cet appartement cosmique, du moins dans les petites tâches de la vie quotidienne. Toutefois, la remplaçante de Mir s'apprête tout de même à quitter le sol. Il s'agira cette fois d'une station spatiale internationale, premier élément en orbite à la fin de l'année prochaine. Die erste französische Astronautin ist heute zusammen mit zwei russischen Kosmonauten von der Weltraumstation Mir zur Erde zurückgekehrt. Mit der Raumfähre Soyuz TM23 landeten sie am Morgen in der Steppe von Kasachstan. Die russischen Kosmonauten waren seit Februar im All. Die 39-jährige Französin hatte sich zwei Wochen an Bord der Mir aufgehalten und medizinische und biologische Experimente durchgeführt. Frankreich und Russland unterzeichneten heute einen Vertrag über eine weitere Zusammenarbeit im All. The southeastern US coast, the shuttle Atlantis slowly moves to safety. NASA managers rolled the massive shuttle back into its protective hangar Wednesday. The hurricane is expected to hit the US sometime Thursday. The hurricane is packing winds of up to 185 kilometers an hour and it's expected to gain even more strength in the next few hours. People along the southeast coast of the United States have not yet been ordered to evacuate, but many have been urged to do so. Fran is expected to make a landfall on Thursday, somewhere between the east coast states of Florida and North Carolina. Hurricane watches have now been posted from Sebastian Inland, Florida, north to Oregon Inland in North Carolina. Schluss heute wieder wie versprochen unser Blick auf den Hurricane Fran. Er bewegt sich unvermindert wieder auf, die Südosten der Vereinigten, auf den Südosten der Vereinigten Staaten zu. Auch die Geschwindigkeit immer noch 185 km in der Stunde. Aber er bewegt sich jetzt etwas schneller mit 22 km in der Stunde. Und er hat offensichtlich seine größte Stärke noch nicht erreicht. Man rechnet damit, dass er irgendwo bei South Carolina wahrscheinlich an Land geht. Und zwar nach unserer mitteleuropäischen Zeit morgen um 6 Uhr. Und The story is making headlines at this hour. The weather system known as Fran has been downgraded from a hurricane to a tropical storm, but it is still posing a threat to life and property. Fran is being blamed for at least 12 deaths in the southeastern US. Fran, dieser Hurricane hat jetzt das Festland erreicht, liegt jetzt zur Zeit über Virginia und ist noch ein sehr starkes Orkantief. Und jetzt kommt In der vergangenen Nacht war Fran mit Windgeschwindigkeiten von bis zu 200 km pro Stunde über die Küste hinweggefegt. Im ersten Tageslicht, sieben Stunden nachdem das Auge von Hurricane Fran über ihre Stadt hinweggezogen war, kamen die Bürger von Wilmington, North Carolina aus ihren Häusern, um die Schäden zu sehen. Sie werden noch Tage brauchen, bis sie wissen, was Fran ihren Staat gekostet hat. Die am schlimmsten getroffenen Gebiete sind noch immer gesperrt, auch für uns. Aber die Sachschäden entlang der Atlantikküste der USA gehen jedenfalls in die Hunderte von Millionen Dollar. Zwölf Tote sind bestätigt, es könnten mehr werden. Der gesamte Staat North Carolina ist Katastrophengebiet. Und doch sagen viele hier, es hätte noch schlimmer kommen können, wie vor sieben Jahren bei Hurricane Hugo mit 29 Toten und 8 Milliarden Dollar Schaden. Und sie machen sich, wie schon so oft, wieder an die Aufräumungsarbeit.
Man hat den Sturm kommen sehen. Die Katastrophenhelfer waren vorbereitet und rücken mit schwerem Material an. Sie waren noch in der Gegend. Die Aufräumungsarbeiten von Hurricane Bertha waren nicht abgeschlossen. Der ist schließlich erst sieben Wochen her. Trotzdem kann sich Charles Ducker nicht vorstellen, irgendwo anders zu leben. Hier bin ich nun mal zu Hause. Und so schlimm war es nun auch wieder nicht. Sachschaden hauptsächlich. Und dafür danken wir dem Herrgott. Angesichts der Toten und der jedenfalls gewaltigen Schäden mag es ja fast makaber klingen, aber es kann durchaus sein, dass Hurricane Fran den sturmerprobten Menschen dieser Gegend als der Hurricane in Erinnerung bleiben wird, dem sie noch einmal einigermaßen davongekommen sind. The storm killed 12 people in the Carolinas and caused widespread destruction. Fran is now downgraded to a tropical depression as it spends its remaining strength on the U.S. state of Virginia. The powerful hurricane submerged some beach towns, ripped apart homes and left more than a million people without electricity. U.S. President Bill Clinton has de declared the state of North Carolina a disaster area. That designation will provide federal funds to help the coastal communities rebuild after the destruction. Fran crossed paths with Bob Dole Friday, and Fran won. She headed up the eastern seaboard instead of him. It's cut our travel plans today. We were supposed to be in New Jersey this afternoon, but it's not good flying weather. It's a campaign that can't even buy a break. In the week after a raucous Labor Day send-off in St. Louis, the decidedly underdog Dole campaign has had its message muffled by the U.S. attack on Iraq, the departure of Dole's top two ad consultants in an internal dispute, and a hurricane. But Fran may have saved the Republican nominee from another bobble. Dole's staff had set up a tour in New Jersey through a factory which makes life rafts. Not an ideal stop for a struggling campaign. In North Carolina sind noch mehr als eine Million Menschen ohne Strom. Nahe Wilmington wurden fast alle Häuser zerstört. Der Bundesstaat wurde bereits zum vierten Mal in diesem Jahr von schweren Stürmen und Hochwassern heimgesucht. Die US-Astronautin Janet Lucid hat einen neuen Aufenthaltsrekord für Frauen im Weltraum aufgestellt. Seit 170 Tagen befindet sie sich in der russischen Raumstation Mir. Lucid stellte damit den Rekord der Kosmonautin Elena Kondakova ein, die 169 Tage im Weltall verbracht hatte. Die Bestleistung war nicht geplant. Technische Probleme und ein Hurricane hatten die Rückkehr zur Erde mehrfach verzögert. Nun ist sie für den 26. September geplant. In Shannon Lucid hat einen unfreiwilligen Weltallrekord aufgestellt. Ohne Unterbrechung verbrachte die 53-jährige Amerikanerin 170 Tage an Bord der russischen Raumstation Mir. Technische Probleme und der Hurricane Fran verzögerten den Start der Atlantis, der die Amerikanerin von der Mir abholen sollte. Als Shannon Lucid im März dieses Jahres mit der russischen Raumstation Mir ins All startete, hatte sie nicht die Absicht, einen weiblichen Weltrekord aufzustellen. Geplant war ihre Rückkehr bereits für Anfang August. Traurig ist die Mutter von drei Kindern, die bereits zum fünften Mal im All unterwegs ist, aber nicht über die Verlängerung ihres Weltraumurlaubs. Es war eine wunderbare Erfahrung. Ich habe jede einzelne Minute genossen. Am Samstag brach Shannon Lucid damit den bisherigen weiblichen Rekord der russischen Astronautin Jelena Kondakova um einen Tag. Jetzt soll die Atlantis am 16. September zur Mir starten. Läuft alles nach Plan, ist Lucid am 26. September wieder auf der Erde, nach insgesamt 188 Tagen im All. Wappen auch in die amerikanische Hauptstadt Washington. Unterhalb des Washington Monuments fahren die Autos durch das Wasser des Potomac-Flusses. Innerhalb von vier Tagen ist der Pegel an manchen Stellen um mehr als 7,5 Meter angestiegen. In vielen Ortschaften hat der Strom Häuser überflutet. Kanus sind in den Straßen dort derzeit die geeignetsten Fortbewegungsmittel. Insgesamt 30.000 Menschen mussten vor den Fluten fliehen. Die Hochwasser trafen außer der Hauptstadt auch die Bundesstaaten Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia und North Carolina. Die Fluten behindern auch die Rückkehr der 500.000 Menschen, die vor dem Wirbelsturm in das Landesinnere geflohen waren. Viele von ihnen werden feststellen, dass ihnen nichts geblieben ist. Sie haben im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes kein Dach mehr über dem Kopf. Die Versicherungen schätzen, dass durch Fran Schäden in Höhe von 1,5 Milliarden Mark entstanden sind. Mindestens 22 Menschen kamen ums Leben. Being allowed back to their shattered homes, Hurricane Fran tore through the coastal region late Thursday, shredding homes and cutting off power to hundreds of thousands of people. More bad weather may be on the way. Hurricane Hortense is slowly moving towards the U.S. Kaum hat Fran in North Carolina und äh, in Virginia sein Unheil getrieben, schon zieht der nächste Hurricane 
die, eine Bahn der Verwüstung über die karibischen Insel. In Puerto Rico ist er äh, um 4 Uhr Ortszeit heute Morgen angekommen. Inzwischen ist auf der Dominikanischen Republik jetzt äh, Sturmwarnung ausgelöst worden und dort soll er noch heute im Laufe des Tages ankommen. Wir werden Sie weiter auf dem Laufenden halten, denn der nächste Sturm braut sich draußen auf dem Atlantik auch schon wieder zusammen. Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend. NASA Astronaut Shannon Lucid must be wondering if she's ever going to get back to Earth. Lucid has been on board the Russian space station Mir since March. She was originally due home in August, but then her ride, the shuttle Atlantis, was delayed six weeks by weather and rocket problems. This week, another delay. Atlantis was moved off the launch pad briefly because of Hurricane Fran. If it's any consolation, this weekend hey, Lucid passes the old record for time spent in space by a woman, 169 days, set by Russian cosmonaut Elena Kondakova last year. Some new pictures released this week of what scientists believe are the building blocks of galaxies. They come courtesy of the Hubble Space Telescope. The images show a series of 18 star clusters deep in the constellation Hercules. These clumps are about 11 billion light years away from Earth, which means the images we are seeing here now were created not long after the Big Bang. The clumps are the right size and in the right place to suggest they eventually merge together to form galaxy-sized clusters. Researchers used a supercomputer to create a model of what that formation might have looked like. You could title it, A Star is Born. If Mr. Spock was asked to assess Star Trek's 30-year run, he would probably say, fascinating. How could a television show and its characters become such an integral part of American culture and develop such a fervent following? As Dennis Michael reports, while the casts and starships have changed over the years, the show's message of hope for humankind remains constant. Space, the final frontier. Frontier was a key word. Star Trek was at first a Western in funny clothes, described by its creator Gene Roddenberry as wagon train to the stars. But over the course of its transformation from failed TV show to cultural phenomenon, it became much more. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Star Trek yielded a series of films, a next-generation television series, and spin-offs Deep Space Nine and Voyager, seven movies, 15 seasons of television. The themes involved are, are durable. They're very durable. They've been around for a long time and will continue to be around. And, and I think when Star Trek is at its best, it's dealing with very current, uh, always current themes. The impact of Star Trek can be felt throughout our culture. It's hard-pressed to find Uh, someone who doesn't know what a, a, a phaser is, or beam me up means, or, or what warp speed means, or what a Klingon is. These are things that are uh, part of the, uh, of the American mythology, part of, uh, uh, of American nomenclature. But it isn't just special effects or zippy action sequences that keep Star Trek a viable franchise. According to Star Trek's newest captain, Kate Mulgrew, it's an attitude. Star Trek is about hope. There's a responsibility here. There's a kind of uh, cachet here that I think exists nowhere else. And the fact that it survived for 30 years uh, says a great deal, I think, for its intelligence. I think that, that all of it has been very good entertainment uh, and, and enlightening uh, and illuminating about our lives, uh, give us, giving us some insight into the human condition and about who we are and who we strive to be and what we are at our best. The late Gene Roddenberry was honored at the NASA facility in Huntsville, Alabama. Majel Barrett Roddenberry was there to represent her late husband. These are Gene's own words. Why are we now traveling into space? Well, why indeed do we trouble to look past the next mountain? Our prime obligation to ourselves is to make the unknown known. We're on a journey to keep an appointment with whatever we are. And the future of the future? For us, the, the job is to just keep trying to do it the best we can. Sounds like fun. Dennis Michael, CNN Entertainment News, Hollywood. For U.S. astronaut Shannon Lucid, this one's been a high-flying record-setting adventure that's lasted quite a bit longer than expected. Sure has. She has been aboard the Russian space station Mir since March, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Problems with shuttles, booster rockets, and weather concerns delayed her return to Earth. Finally, she should soon have a ride home. Knocking on some wood here. With CNN's John Holloman's join us now, and he's all hooked up to talk with Lucid live from the Mir space station. He's in Washington. John. Hi, John. Hey, I'm Donna. Good morning. Shannon Lucid, right to you. What do you miss most, having been away from home for 174 days? Well, I guess I miss my family most of all. 
Well, I imagine, I, I, let me ask you this. John Blaha is coming up to replace you okay. shortly. What advice are you, have you given him as far as things he should do before he leaves Earth for a long stay in space? And I uh, sent him a note and told him just to relax and just to enjoy his time up here and not, you know, try to worry. He likes to sometimes think about a lot of the details, just not to get bogged down in the details, but just to come on up, just relax, take each day to come and enjoy each day, and he'll have a great time. What's the biggest thing about you that's changed while you've been away, do you think? Well, uh, I told my family that I've developed patience. <laughs> and I know that right now they're thinking that uh, they hope that's true because sometimes I can get a little impatient. Yeah. We, last time we talked, I think, we talked about physical changes in your body. You said your feet had calluses on them when you left the earth and uh, you don't wear shoes much up there, so that's gone away. Anything else changed about you physically that you can detect through your, either your medical tests or just looking at yourself every day or two? I've always felt, uh, but my the bottoms of my feet do uh, look different. They look just like a baby, the bottom of a baby's foot right now. Actually, uh, when Yuri and Yuri were still up here, we were talking about that just a little bit. And on the last progress, a picture came up. It was a photograph that was taken when 76 was up here, when I first got up here. And we were looking at that picture and then sort of looking at what we look like uh, right now. And we all sort of decided that we looked just a little bit younger than uh, we did when we started the flight. I think maybe it's because, you know, on Earth, gravity is uh, pulling your facial features sort of down. And up here, they don't have that pull of gravity. So maybe uh, we do look just a little bit younger than we did when we were on the Earth. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But I told my husband not to worry. Even though we've discovered the fountain of the youth, maybe, uh, maybe I'm still headed home whenever the shuttle gets here. <laughs> Are you going to have a different kind of physical recovery staying up there for about six months than you would have staying in space for, I guess, the three months, uh, give or take a week or two, that was originally planned? I think it'll be tougher to readapt to Earth because you've been away so much longer than you'd planned for? Uh, I don't know. I guess that's one of the things I want to find out. I just really don't know. I was talking to Sasha. He's uh, one of the new crew members that are up here now, and this is his second flight. And he was, uh, his opinion is that it sort of takes a month for month, you know, uh, until you really feel back like you did before the flight. So I guess I'll find out. That'll be something uh, interesting to discover. As you've uh, wound up most of your experiments, I'm imagining you've had more time to look out the windows. There have been all these terrific-looking hurricanes down here on Earth, and certainly they've been devastating on Earth. What do they look like from space? Well, they look like... Uh, like the pictures that you see of hurricanes, you know, great big white uh, clouds uh, swirling around. Uh, it's really uh, pretty interesting to watch them, but as you look at them from up here, it's sort of hard to believe that they carry that much devastation within them, you know, on the other side of them, because we're looking down on top, and it's just, you know, sort of an even circular uh, white cloud, and it's just hard to comprehend the misery and devastation that they're bringing to the people that, uh, you know, whose lives are touching down there on the earth. Yeah, as you prepare to come home, what's the first thing you're going to do when you're uh, able to do something for yourself back here on Earth? Oh, uh, I guess one of the first things I want to do, I want to go out to the bookstore and see what the new books have been published in the last six months and um, just browse in the bookstore for a long period of time. And um, I'm looking forward, you know, to getting out on my bicycle and riding and, uh, you know, feeling the wind in your face and the sun on your back. And I'm also looking forward to uh, getting on my rotoblades and going rotoblading with my daughters. <laughs> Shannon Lucid, thanks for joining us today from the Mir, which is orbiting above the Russia at this moment. We'll be talking to you. Donna, Leon, that's it from here for now. All right, All right John, right, thanks. John, heard here first. Man, worst thing about space, no rollerblading. Yeah, rollerblades bring back those calluses on the feet <laughs> bring again. Bring it back for her. <laughs> God, I yeah. hope she comes back home soon. I'm yeah. sure her husband's saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, All isn't right. it neat, too, that she talks about the simple pleasures that she can't wait to get back to? Yeah. All right, good luck.
ancient Greeks looked to the stars and saw stories, which they called constellations. The Egyptians looked to the sun and saw a god they called Ra. And even just a few years ago, the men and women who traveled into space were considered a breed apart by those of us on the ground. Hello, I'm Jonathan Mann. Welcome now to Insight. There is a small drama underway in orbit. Yet times have changed to the point where even Shannon Lucid's unusual predicament is drawing little special attention. Shannon Lucid is a U.S. astronaut who's been on board the Russian space station Mir for nearly six months. That's a record in space for a woman, a record won by default. Shannon Lucid's trip home on the space shuttle Atlantis has been repeatedly delayed by problems with its booster rockets and by Hurricane Fran. According to the latest plan, she'll be home by the end of the month. Shannon Lucid remains upbeat, but she told CNN Thursday she's got some very definite plans when she finally does make it back to Earth. and see what the new books have been published in the last six months and uh, just browse in the bookstore for a long period of time. And um, I'm looking forward, you know, to getting out on my bicycle and riding and, uh, you know, feeling the wind in your face and the sun on your back. And I'm also looking forward to uh, getting on my rollerblades and going rollerblading with my daughter. Looking forward to the wind and the sun and some good times with her family. But no parades, no national celebration. Space is now seen as a place to make money. Not a great historic adventure. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. The recent flurry of excitement over the possibility of life on Mars was a reminder of how fascinated we all once were with space and how that fascination has almost dissipated. was a time when space captured the world's attention. Space exploration was one of the measuring sticks for the superpowers to gauge their rivalry. Russia got an early lead when it put the first man into space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, on April 12, 1961. <laughs> Not to be outdone, the U.S. followed Russia's lead by putting its own astronauts into orbit, and then the U.S. upped the ante, winning the biggest race, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men on the moon. It was an event the entire planet watched and listened to. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Those days, 30 years ago, were the glory days of space exploration. Every mission was front page news, every cosmonaut and astronaut came home a national hero. But as the saying goes, times have changed. Now, when the space shuttle lifts off for another out-of-this-world voyage, few people on this world pay much attention. The astronauts are anonymous, not nearly the household names they were in the 1960s and 70s. And the space programs of both the United States and Russia have seen their budgets slashed in recent years. There are still occasional moments of success and excitement. But mostly space has become a place of big business, not big adventure. In the future, the space shuttle won't even be owned by the U.S. government. A group of U.S. companies have been picked to take the shuttle business into the next century. And the shuttle is basically all there is when it comes to real space exploration. Nowadays, most of the rockets we send towards the heavens don't even have people on them. Man's reach into space these days is more for profit than exploration. And it is much more profitable to carry a satellite than an astronaut. That scene will be repeated around the globe about 35 times this year. Rockets putting satellites into orbit are big business, with hundreds of billions of dollars being spent and tens of billions to be made in profits. And the leader in this field is not one of the early space explorers from the United States or Russia. It is Europe. Ariane Spas, a European consortium based in France, dominates the satellite launching business. In fact, about 60% of all the satellites put into space in the past few years have been put there by Ariane. It's a high-stakes business, usually costing more than $100 million just to stage a launch. And the satellites being carried on these rockets are worth hundreds of millions more. But with big money comes big risk. In the launch business, there's no second chance. Failure when you put up a satellite almost always means a total loss. First six solids have been jettisoned. 
Rockets can unpredictably blow up, veer off course, or just fail to put the satellite into the proper orbit. Insuring the satellites costs tens of millions of dollars each flight. But with so much money to be made on a successful launch, there are plenty of players trying to take some of Ariane's business. Leading the list are two U.S. companies, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed Martin. Combined, they do about half as much business as Ariane. Their rockets are smaller than Ariane's and yet almost as expensive. The reason is that the U.S. rockets were originally designed to carry warheads in a nuclear attack, not communication satellites into a global orbit. As a result, the U.S. companies have been playing catch-up with Ariane. Both McDonnell and Lockheed plan to unveil new rockets in the next couple of years, but even the new versions will not be as powerful as the existing European launchers. Meanwhile, Ariane has already unveiled its own newer, more powerful rocket, called the Ariane 5. However, its first launch did not exactly go as planned. Tous les paramètres propulsifs sont normaux et la trajectoire est normale. Ariane 5 has been 10 years in the making and cost European governments $8 billion to develop. But officials say the initial problems are being worked out. And there are other players in this business. Russia is using its decades of experience in space to get into the satellite launching game. It has developed partnerships with U.S. companies to use the Russian Proton rocket, considered one of the most reliable around. But if you want to send a satellite into orbit as cheaply as possible, send it up on a Chinese rocket. The Chinese government's support of its state program allows it to launch satellites for about half the cost of a U.S. or European company. However, the Chinese rockets are not nearly as reliable. This rocket veered off course and struck a nearby Chinese village in February. China says there were a few deaths. Unofficial reports say the village was ruined and more than 100 people died. China suspended its satellite launches for four months to investigate. Scientists say man's fascination with space has not ended. Space shuttles still go into orbit several times a year, and there is still worldwide cooperation in the hopes of building a global space station. But there can be no denying that man's idea of space now involves exploitation as much as exploration. So when man looks to the stars these days, does he see discovery or dollars? For insight into that question, we're joined now by James Asker of Aviation Week and Space Technology. Thanks so much for being with us. Glad to be here. From the space race to the space business, how much has changed in terms of the goals, the commitment, and the cash? Well, quite a bit's changed since the beginning of uh, the space programs in the U.S. and Russia. Um, the biggest change is space is much, much more an international activity now. Uh, there's a lot of international cooperation, uh, and of course when uh, space started it was uh, the space race between the United States and Russia, let's see who can get to the moon first. So the nature of it's really changed quite a bit. The, the other big change is uh, space is a business now. Uh, you and I are probably uh, able to talk to each other because of a, a satellite that's in orbit right now. And uh, that, that, of course, is uh, something that uh, drives a lot of the, the money that's involved in space. Well, let's talk about the money. Do you have any rough idea of how much is being spent and how much is being made these days? Well, um, if you look at the, the government space programs in the United States, which uh, of course is the nation that spends the most on space at this point, it's on the order of $30 billion a year. There have been wild predictions over the years of colonization in space, tourism in space. What's the wildest prediction that you think you can make that might come true? Well, colonization would certainly be the, uh, the farthest uh, off. Um, you know, I know some people who've even uh, considered things like uh, manned missions to uh, another star. That, that seems pretty far-fetched at this point. Um, space tourism, believe it or not, though, is probably uh, not so far-fetched. If you can get the, the cost of uh, launching things into orbit down, uh, there have been some studies done that show uh, you, could, uh, you could make a market for that. And, uh, the Japanese are quite quite interested in developing that market. We'll be booking some time, I guess, James. I guess James Asker of Aviation Week and Space Technology. Thanks so much for being with us. You bet. The first men to land on the moon left a plaque there that reads, "We came in peace for all mankind." A little later in the program, we'll talk to one of the men who left that plaque to see what he thinks about the world of space exploration today. 
But coming up next, a conversation with the world leaders in putting men and machines into space. More insight in just a moment. Welcome back. Man or machine? One of the dominant questions about space these days is whether to send men or machines into the heavens. When it comes to machines, the dominant player is Arianespace, the European consortium which has put more satellites into space than anyone else. When it comes to men, the big player is still the U.S. space agency, NASA, and its space shuttles. We spoke with Doug Hayden, the head of Ariana Spass's operations in the United States, and Alan Ladwig, NASA's Associate Administrator for Policy and Plans. And we began by talking about the businesses that didn't take off in space. There were predictions of manufacturing and even tourism in the heavens. Instead, so far, the only business up there is satellites. Today, uh, today it's limited to uh, satellites uh, for commercial money-making opportunity, clearly. Uh, there's no question that the cost of access to space with the types of rockets we have today, chemical rockets, is high and it will remain high until dramatic changes are made in both the technology and the operations of, uh, of the systems. Uh, there is hope, of course, that reusable systems uh, of a much greater le efficiency level even than the shuttle in the future might uh, find a substantial reduction in the cost to orbit, but today it is expensive and therefore those things you mentioned uh, manufacturing space and tourism in particular are uh, are still in the uh, uh, to be realized stage Alan Ladwig of NASA how keenly do you feel the competition in space these days well I guess it depends in what uh, again which business sector arena are you talking about the, uh, the the areas of concern to NASA certainly in the aviation area the first a of NASA the competition is extreme between US companies and uh, especially in Europe it's a $38 billion industry for America. It's a, it's a huge uh, positive balance of payments for this country. The competition in the launch market area is very extreme. Uh, there was a time when the American companies uh, had the majority of commercial satellite launches. We've lost that to the competition from Ariane. Uh, in the area of robotics, uh, we have we lost the uh, fixed robotics competition, but we are now the leader in f in uh, mobile robotics. So it it just depends. I mean, the, the thing about the space program and the difference from today and 20 years ago is the tremendous number of opportunities that exist today, and the challenge is to figure out where best to place our resources that'll have the best return to the taxpayer and to the nation as a whole. Doug Hayden of Arianas Boss, we've been talking about this in very cold clinical terms, in terms of numbers and money, but is there still the same passion in the space business that there was when it was a space race? I think certainly there is uh, among the people who are, uh, who are directly involved in it. Uh, for example, we have uh, a video uh, presentation here in Washington for each of our launches from Karoo in, in the French Guiana in South America. And uh, we have a small number of people, anywhere from 50 to 150. And uh, people keep asking me if it's become routine. Well, I've been in this business since 1961, and it hasn't got routine yet. So I think it's a, it's a question of viewpoint. It's become, I'm afraid, routine to a lot of the outside viewers. And uh, I think for those of us who are involved, it's still very much a, uh, a thrill to be part of it. And if you want to talk about passion, look at the tremendous world response to the finding of the uh, Mars meteorite and the kind of the emotions that is all brought up, the finding of uh, ice around uh, Europa, a planet of uh, Jupiter, uh, and the findings that the Hubble Space Telescope continues to bring forward, the excitement that people are feeling about the coming of the International Space Station with the first element launched next year, the docking in September of the shuttle with the Mir. All these things capture tremendous public interest, and I think we're, we're into a period where the mood is back on the upswing because so many positive things are coming from our investment. How much, Alan Ladwig, do you think is going to come from just that one little rock from Mars? Well, certainly uh, a revival of interest in, in the whole question of is there life uh, elsewhere in the solar system? Indeed, is, could there be life uh, beyond the solar system as part of NASA's new origins program? Uh, we don't want to overhype uh, what's going to happen with this meteorite. It could find out that uh, be, as we do further tests with this and have other science study it, 
Uh, we may find out that uh, this, this uh, carbon that they think is in the meteorite came didn't come from Mars after all. And if that were the case, that would still be okay because we've advanced knowledge. We've gotten people excited again. We're going to do more to, to, to understand what this is all about. So we'll have to wait and see. We don't want to, uh, our administrator at NASA headquarters, Dan Golden, has been very clear to say, let us not uh, get carried away until we have conclusive evidence, and we are not going to make any long-term plans until we have the conclusive evidence that we're looking for. Let me ask you both one final question. We'll start with you, Doug Hayden of Ariana Spas. Are there any surprises left for us in space about what we'll find in space or what space will do for us? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, great things about this business is that there's a whole bunch of unknowns, and there are even the, <laughs> what, uh, a general I knew years ago called the unknowns, the unknown unknowns, things that will surprise us completely. Uh, a lot of them will come from uh, uh, having increased access, the thing we talked about earlier in the program of, of getting costs down and having ways to get more things there. Uh, all sorts of things that we can't even imagine today will, will happen. Uh, things are happening today that we didn't imagine five years ago in terms of communications alone. So I think the surprise factor is going to remain very high. Alan Ladwig? It's, there's a story how the head of the U.S. Patent Office once said that all the inventions that were ever going to be invented have been invented, therefore we could close the patent office. So your question reminds me of that a little bit. The unknowns are always going to be there. Uh, as we increase our technology capabilities, we're going to find things that have been right in front of us all along. As we uh, bring down launch costs and bring more and more companies and participation into this business, uh, who knows where it's all going to go, but I'm convinced it's going to be very exciting and beyond anything we can sit here and predict today. Alan Ladwig of NASA, thanks very much. Our thanks as well to Doug Hayden of Ariana Spas. When we come back, a conversation with one of the heroes of a business with few heroes left, a man who walked on the moon. There are few groups as exclusive as the one our next guest belongs to. He is one of only 12 men to ever set foot on the moon. In fact, he was just the second person to do it. Buzz Aldrin followed Neil Armstrong onto the moon's surface on July 20th, 1969. Today, he is still an advocate of space exploration as chairman of the National Space Society, a group dedicated to a permanent presence for man in space. We got in touch with him at the Johnson Space Center and asked him if when he began his career in space, he saw it as a personal challenge or a military one. No, it was a career extension. Uh, I had embarked uh, as a fighter pilot uh, with the Air Force and uh, I was furthering my education and uh, chose to uh, look into space rendezvous and uh, I sort of got bit by the bug of uh, flying in space by uh, my doctoral studies at MIT and that uh, eventually qualified me to get into the astronaut program. Uh, but I certainly uh, just viewed it as an extension of my career. It certainly wasn't military. I was looking for ways that I could enhance my career in the future, but it was a great opportunity to join up with the uh, other test pilots uh, who had uh, pioneered uh, space before I came along. Do we make too much of it, do you think, when we remember back to it as a more romantic time, a time when personal bravery, even manliness, was on the line? Well, I, I don't think you can compare the manliness uh, then to today. Uh, they're, they're just as uh, virile and aggressive uh, people. It's just that the climate of the nation has changed. We were in a very exciting, pioneering period. Uh, then we're also in the midst of the Cold War and the competitiveness uh, that uh, really spurned the uh, the uh, entire space program really got us off into uh, flying in space primarily based on missiles. Uh, Sputnik was, uh, was launched by a missile and uh, Yuri Gagarin, Alan Shepard, uh, all the uh, Gemini missions were launched on missiles and uh, then we made a, a commitment to uh, go to the moon and to be there first. And uh, to do that you don't re develop a reusable rockets. So uh, we, we uh, really embarked on an expendable throwaway rocket uh, space program. In the years since, space science and space exploration have taken a very different turn. Would you have predicted the way it's gone, the way space has been commercialized? I found that I'm, in the past, I don't think I was that good a predictor. Uh, I was just looking at the job in front of me and the wonderful opportunities. Uh, but certainly, uh, right after we landed on the moon, a space task group, uh, studied what our future could be and uh, perhaps should be and made recommendations and uh, there were 
uh, low level, medium level, and high level of uh, intensity recommendations for space programs in the future. And even the low level recommendation in the fall of 1969 had us reaching uh, Mars uh, by the early 1990s. So what happened? Did the excitement just fade away? No, there were some other competing uh, events going on. In Southeast Asia, there was the Vietnam War, there was the uh, effect of the 60s, uh, the drug culture, the questioning the establishment, uh, Watergate. Uh, all these things had an impact, and, uh, and I think the fact that we uh, made a commitment to go to the moon and we won that race, it was a bitter disappointment to the Soviets, uh, but that phase of it uh, was essentially over. We didn't really anticipate that we would have to uh, withdraw quite so completely and go five, almost six years without even flying an American in space. That certainly wasn't typical of the space program we charted out in the early 60s. So what are your thoughts about the future in space? Is it going to be a place for exploration, for science, for business above all? We're going to do all of those things. I'm extremely optimistic about the future. I am concerned about some of the immediate decisions that we make and, uh, and whether we base those always on short-term considerations or whether we make an investment uh, in the long term in the future the way I think we did when we made a commitment to go to the moon. Buzz Aldrin, author, astronaut, and chairman of the National Space Society, thanks so much for being with us. One last word before we go about a space project that has a great many people very excited. Remember that rock we talked about earlier on the program? It contained what may be the residue of past life on Mars. Well, that rock was part of a meteorite found here on Earth in an Arctic ice field. Scientists have now decided to go back to that ice field to look for more rocks. The operation will be relatively low-tech, a bunch of bundled-up men and women looking for black rocks in the ice. Not only that, but despite everything we've been talking about here today, there is no prospect of the thing making any money. And with that, we bring this edition of Insight to a close. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Mitt.